So uh, we're talking about diagnostics, a test which aid in the diagnosis of disease. Um, and these tests have inherent characteristics such as sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Uh, each test has a likelihood ratio, and this modifies uh, the pretest probability of uh, the part probability of a disease, and so it helps us rule in or rule out disease. And the most important uh, utility for, for diagnostics is really when you have cases where you're not really sure what's going on. Because, for instance, if it's a dengue case and the platelets are going down, um, it pretty much gives you a good clinical diagnosis. But, for instance, if in patients who have intermediate probability of heart disease, then it's important to be able to confirm or rule out that diagnosis because it can change the outcome in terms of whether you do some sort of uh, intervention or not, especially when those interventions are invasive. The best results are always what we call the gold standard, uh, for instance, a tissue diagnosis, but it's not always all that practical because you can have uh, very invasive diseases or in the cases of autopsies, you know, the results, you know what happened to the patient, but unfortunately it comes too late. And for infectious diseases in particular, uh, when we talk about a gold standard, more often than not, it's really a culture because you're growing the organism and you're able to test the organism. So abilities, you're able to test for characteristics, which more or less tells you that that is uh, what you're dealing with. Now, the pearls of cultures are that they're highly specific, and obviously recovery of an organism is a sine qua non, and it, it's there. So it's very difficult to dispute the presence of something when, when, when it's growing right in front of you. However, in general, culture, cultures are very expensive. They're highly technical. They're also prone to contamination, which reduces their utility if that happens. At the same time, uh, it has low sensitivity. I'm sorry, it's not specificity, but low sensitivity. Um, in fact, they, they, they think that blood culture is a single blood culture is only about 60% sensitive. You may miss uh, different uh, different uh, organisms, especially those that are difficult to grow. And it can have a long turnaround time, and uh, especially for slow-growing organisms. Like, for instance, for, um, for tuberculosis, uh, it can take about eight weeks before you have an answer from a culture standpoint. And for unculturable or difficult to culture organisms, uh, traditionally we've looked at antibody dyers using either ELISA, indirect chemoillumination, or other laboratory techniques. And these have been highly sensitive and specific. They've been fairly successful, but they typically require either paired convalescera, where you actually demonstrate an increase in dyers to definitively demonstrate infection, but it can still be highly technical. Uh, you may need a laboratory to, to, to do these kinds of tests. False positives, especially when you're dealing with immunoglobulin M, which is very sticky because it's a pentamer. I mean, a lot of us have had cases where both the IgM for typhoid and dengue are positive, and you're not really sure what to do with those. And the same titer may not uh, necessarily give you uh, a good idea, and you cannot distinguish between current and past infection. For instance, if you talk about leptospirosis, a lot of people may have low levels of leptospire antibodies uh, just because of constant exposure, but that does not necessarily correlate to active disease. And uh, looking at newer techniques that have become conventional for us or usually is, for instance, conventional PCR techniques, which uh, previously were used to amplify genetic material but they're actually very good for detecting unculturable or difficult to culture organisms. This is a very sensitive test and it's very specific as well because you're talking about a very specific uh, genetic uh, signature and uh, you only need very small amounts of material. But again, highly technical, it's relatively expensive although the cost uh, keeps going down and it's not standardized. A lot of labs have their own protocols called homebrews. And of course, it's easily contaminated because um, if you have uh, just a little bit of uh, contaminated, contaminating material, say it's like kind of floating out in the air um, and it lands on your, on your PCR mix, you can actually end up with a false positive in that sense. So there's a lot of next generation diagnostics. And uh, for our intents and purposes, we'll focus on about uh, five of them. 
uh, we want to think about simplification of all tests with uh, of all, all tests which uh, are really the antibody tests. Uh, for instance, the HIV antibody rapid test, which is now point of care. Also antigen tests like sandwich elizas, which we're now using for malaria and for dengue. Uh, multiplex real-time PCR or quantitative PCR. Uh, RT-PCR is, uh, is different, and uh, such as Luminex multiplex assays and micro -array platforms. Also a gene expert, which is a real-time PCR with molecular beacons to detect resistance. And there's more of these coming up. Uh, for Because of time constraints, we're not really going to talk about next generation sequencing at this time, but that is a very, very exciting area of molecular biology where we're able to do multiple populations of, of, of quasi-species um, and are better at characterizing viral populations. There's also another very thing called Malditon, um, uh, which is really a time-of-flight mass spectroscopy which gives specific characteristics to certain organisms. So for instance, if you're looking at a bacterial culture and you do Malditop on it, you can actually identify that organism uh, within, within hours as opposed to days with, with the cultures. And of course, you can combine all these little techniques where you have multi-assay uh, microfluidics, like lateral flow assays. We have these microfluidic tests where you're testing for all the STDs known to man on one on one, one plate for instance, HIV, syphilis, and then there, we'll talk about uh, an assay that is homegrown and was developed in our institute by Dr. Raul Stura, which is called the Biotech M lamp assay, which uh, looks at the genetic signature of, um, which basically looks at the genetic signature of dengue, and uh, uh, it comes out to be a much cheaper but more accurate test than what's commercially available. So let's start with the first one where we're simplifying old tests to make them near or point of care. And this usually uses techniques called lateral flow assays or microfluidics. So you're using na the nanoparticles and miniaturized materials to simulate what big, big equipment does in a very small space. And so you need very little, um, very little sample. And you also have a very fast reaction because you're dealing with very small amounts of of material. So for instance, if you think about the, probably the oldest point of care test you can think about is maybe a pregnancy test, which actually um, uh, is a lateral flow assay. Now for infectious diseases, uh, we're using it routinely for, um, for HIV, where you can actually do an HIV test in about 20 minutes. And it really is like a pregnancy test where you actually see a line uh, go positive, it's positive, or just a control line if it's negative. And this is usually used useful for detecting either antibodies or antigens. Technically, it's a lot easier to look at antibodies, but antigens, as we'll see in the next um, uh, example, uh, can be detected as well. And there's a lot of newer microfluidic techniques where they basically have injected molded plastic on a nanoscale that you can do different kinds of things that you can only do with much bigger pieces of equipment. Um, so for HIV antibody and microfluidic HIV syphilis tests, um, these basically use a, um, for instance, a, a test line. Here in this uh, example, it's actually uh, an, an anthrax antigen, and it's looking at protective antibodies against anthrax. And so if you have a sample that has the antibodies, these go through and take along a label um, uh, antibodies with microparticles, and these stick to the antigen. Um, to I'm sorry, this, these stick to the antigen that's on the line, and these can be detected uh, uh, because there is the nanoparticle that can either fluoresce or give you a a colored reaction. And then this is just an example of uh, how extensive uh, you can make microfluidics because different characteristics on the nanoparticle level can give you a simulation of much bigger machines. So you can actually have what we call a lab on a stick or a lab on a plate uh, because all these things can be simulated on a plate so that even though it's a very complicated reaction, or a series of complicated reactions, you can have a meaningful result. It doesn't only save uh, money, it saves a lot of time, and it makes very sophisticated 
tests available near point of care or even without the use of expensive equipment. Now, looking at antigen tests, which are slightly different from antibody tests, this is where you're actually using monoclonal antibodies to capture uh, the antigen that's present in a body fluid, say in the blood or in the sputum, in the saliva. Um, and these are superior to antibody tests because antibody tests, um, they uh, basically look at the, the, uh, the uh, something that the body produces uh, in response to an infection, but looking at antigen really looks for a piece of the organism and tells you that the organism is there. However, because antigens can last for a long time in the body, it's still not used as a test for cure. I mean, antibodies never were a test for cure because they can they can last a lifetime. For instance, for for um, a TPHA, which is used for syphilis, those last for a lifetime. But for antigen, um, it has a span, but it may take a while for it to go away. And if you have low disease burden and you have a limit to the detection of antigens, then low disease burden may occasionally give you false negatives, but never at the level of, say, microscopy or those kinds of things. So, for instance, the ICT filariasis card test looked at a circulating antigen to lymphatic filariasis, and it's really revolutionized uh, the elimination of lymphatic filariasis in the world. There are influenza antigen tests as well. There's the Binax malaria uh, serology test, which can also distinguish between falciparum and non-falciparum malaria. So if we look at, uh, say, this Binax, you can see that there are different control lines. It tells you whether there's a mixed infection if you have these three lines or falciparum if only two lines, uh, non-falciparum malaria, if it's the bottom line, or negative if there's only one control line. Or you take a look at lateral flow assay again, but instead of having a test line of antigen, you actually have a test line of antibodies, which then capture the antigen. And the antigen itself, you have nanoparticles that can be conjugated using the same free um, uh, monoclonal antibody as a detector, and at the end of it all, you still you also have your control panel to make sure that the assay is valid. Now, moving on, uh, we talk about PCR, which basically detects genetic material. Now, there's uh, the newer version of, uh, of PCR is called real-time PCR. We don't call it RT-PCR; we call it qPCR, which is quantitative PCR, because RT-PCR refers to reverse transcript-based PCR which we use for retroviruses or mRNA, and that's a different matter. When we talk about real-time PCR, uh, we talk about quantitative PCR, and the reason it's called quantitative is because you can actually use it to, to quantify how much DNA or how much organism is in a sample. You can use this, you can do this either with non-specific uh, uh, compounds like cyber green, which grows, glows green in the presence of double-stranded DNA, or you can use uh, specific uh, probes that have fluorescent reporters. These are like Dachman or even type DNA probes. There are different kinds of ways to do this. But because you can have a one-to-one -one reaction, if you can detect those fluorophores, then you can actually um, determine how much, uh, or how much organism, how much genetic material is in a sample. So for instance, if you're talking about viral loads for hepatitis C or HIV, uh, you do a real-time PCR so you have, have an idea of what the quantity of those uh, viruses is in, in, in the body fluids. Uh, multiplex PCR now uses different kinds of primer sets. So instead of using just one fluorophore, you can use That several organisms, several sets of, um, uh, of, of several set of um, inf uh, several infections uh, going on in uh, several infections or whatever it is that uh, you're looking for. Now, the great thing about that is that, for instance, if you need to extract, uh, uh, yeah, you need to. Example, you only have to extract it once. As opposed to having five different reaction tubes, you only have one reaction tube, and you're trying to you're detecting several organisms of just one sample. 
And so for the former, for real-time PCR, you usually see it with HIV viral loads. And then for the latter, with multiplex PCR, you have respiratory virus panels. And I'll show you in the next. So when we're talking about Pac-Man probes, there's a very specific kind of probe. You actually have a, um, a primer that has on each end attached a uh, reporter and a quencher um, uh, fluorophore. So the, the quencher um, basically uh, um, uh, quenches the, the fluorescence. But when the um, primer is incorporated and Pac-Man excises the fluorophore, then it's away from the quencher. And so you will see a, a fluorescent signal. And so that one for fluorescent signal represents one DNA one strand DNA amplification. Now, when you talk about respiratory panels that are multiplex, then you use different primers. And each of those primers um, has a specific fluorophore. Or in this case, when you use Luminex, you have virus-specific microspheres. Because each microsphere, which has a different wavelength, is attached to a primer that is specific for a particular virus. So you can actually pull out different viruses um, from one specimen. If it's there, then you will detect it. Now, what about taking all these and putting them together in uh, a way in which you get even more information? So real-time PCR with molecular beacons to detect resistance. Now, you're looking at not just the detection of an organism, but also character, uh, characterizing um, the kind of um, the, the kind of resistance that's going on in that organism. So the most uh, mature of these platforms, the most widely used, is called the Gene Expert. And uh, what it is really, it's a self-contained washing, filtration, real-time PCR, and detection for applications using cartridges. Now the Expert MPB RIF, which is what is being adopted, which is what is being adopted by WHO to replace uh, tuberculosis screening worldwide, is the most mature. But ex gene expert platform can also do HIV viral loads. It can also do um, uh, MRSA and different kinds of detections. But let's talk about expert MPB RIF, uh, which has a very high sensitivity specificity, greater than 95%. And the great part about this is, number one, it replaces, it can replace your usual um, screening test uh, with sputum, and at the same time, it can give you an idea of whether you're dealing with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Typically, it takes about eight weeks for a culture to come back, which tells you whether something has rifampicin resistance. You can get both the detection of tuberculosis and a preliminary test that says whether the, the tuberculosis is resistant or, uh, or susceptible to rifampicin within two hours. And because the whole thing is self-contained, and it's cartridge-based, you only need the level of a medical technologist at a regular lab. They don't even need to know how to do PCR or molecular uh, techniques. All they need to do is know how to handle the samples and how to put the cartridge into the machine, and it does the rest. So the output of expert RIF is detection of tuberculosis and the presence of rifampicin resistance. Now, how does it do this? If you look at the machine, um, basically you put the sputum in one of the cartridges, and if you put it all in there, you know, that's the end of your hands-on work after you transfer the sputum into the cartridge, and then the sample gets automatically filtered and washed, and then you get extraction, ultrasonic lysis, and then the DNA molecules are mixed with dry PCR reagents, and then the detection comes in there as well. And this is what it looks like. Test result, MPB detected, but rifampicin resistance not detected if that's the case. And the time to result is less than two hours, one hour, 45 minutes. The other issue about this is because there's minimal handling of the organism, then there's less risk for the, um, for the person, for the lab tech who is handling it, as opposed to doing two or three sputums or growing it, which is even more uh, hazardous because you need a biosafety level two plus to handle those kinds of cultures. Now, how does it do this? It uses what we call molecular beacon technology. It's similar to Pac-Man, but here you actually have a hairpin, hairpin loop of a primer, which uh, basically has uh, a fluorophore and a quencher. And 
when it is when it finds a complementary strand, then the fluorophore and the quencher are 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 are, are ripped apart basically. And so you see the fluorescence as the presence of the target. And if there's no target, then there's no fluorescence. And so what it does is uh, the RPOB gene uh, is responsible for uh, basically most uh, rifampicin resistance, about 95% of it. And they know specific mutations that occur on the RPOG, uh, RPOB gene. And so they And so if there is a mutation, then those beacons will not bind. So for instance, this is the RPOB gene, and you have different probes. You have five kinds of probes at different sections. So it basically covers the whole um, RPOB gene, which is 81 base pairs. And if you don't have resistance, then all of these probes will bind. And so you should see five fluorescent signals along with one control signal for a total of six fluorescent dyes being detected at the same time. So not only is gene expert uh, a processing machine, a PCR machine, um, it also is a detection machine and it looks at six different colors of these dyes. If one of the colors is missing, then that corresponds to a mutation in the RPOP gene. So if you don't get six fluorescent dyes, six fluorescent signals, then you know that there is uh, the possibility of rifampicin resistance. And this all happens within two hours. And then, of course, there's combinations of the platforms. Now, the most mature of this from our end, from the UP Manila uh, National Institutes of Health, is uh, the Biotech M uh, the Biotech M platform. And this is a near point of care. It's about six, two to six hours. Uh, isothermal PCR. Now, isothermal PCR because uh, PCR polymerase chain reaction usually requires a machine that is a thermocycler. It has different um, different temperatures to denature the DNA, to anneal to denature again and again. But an isothermal PCR is set at one temperature, 65 degrees. And so it's much easier. All you need is a heating block at 65 degrees as opposed to a full a full-blown PCR machine that detects dengue in blood samples. And the phase three clinical trials have been completed, and the data shows that this has actually better performance than the current commercial products, which include IgM, IgG, NS1, at a fraction of the cost. This is locally developed technology for the Filipino people. And it is undergoing, um, uh, well, the trials are done, and uh, these, these are actually going to uh, come out uh, hopefully next year in a lot of the hospitals of the Department of Health. So this is what it looks like. Uh, it uses a reaction tube similar to this and lamp. Uh, it, it uses cyber green, which is a non-specific dye. If there are double-stranded DNA there, then you will see a fluorescent, it's like uh, these these ones. So third and the fourth tubes and the fifth and the sixth tubes uh, show that uh, there is detectable organism in there. Now, LAMP is very, very complicated, but the way it works is that there are at least six primer sets, and what, what happens is at, the, at 65 degrees, because you have different areas amplifying, it's kind of like a zipper. Instead of having to denature it at 90 degrees, the, um, the primers that are working at different levels of the of the gene are actually pulling the double strands apart to serve as more substrates. And so you have a lot of turbidity, and then eventually you can detect that with your uh, cyber view. So in summary, uh, next generation diagnostics have really increased our capacity to make timely diagnosis through innovative utilization of technology. Major advantages really include shorter time to resolve point of care or near point of care. And so that you can strike while the iron is at, in other words, you don't have to lose patients to, um, to follow up because they don't have the results yet. And there's increased sensitivity and specificity, increased information from samples, especially like in the case of multiplexing. In fact, the Centers for Disease Control, when they're doing 
um, disease surveillance, they actually have a machine which has a plate. You put one sample in and you can test for 5,000 different pathogens. And so that's a little bit extreme, but you can actually tailor that. For instance, in the Philippines, one of our more, um, uh, one of our more common dilemmas is whether a patient has dengue or typhoid or leptospirosis. You put all three of those on a lateral flow assay. Then you have a test that is very, very useful for making clinical decisions early in terms of whether you have to give an antibiotic or whether you have to admit a patient. And this also lends itself to automation. Disadvantages are maybe the systems are a bit more complex. But with automated systems, it actually makes it less complex because it takes it uh, out of the hands of the operator. There will be higher initial costs, especially for those which have proprietary technology. But in the long term, if you can actually cost-benefit analysis there, uh, cost-benefit ratio. Um, if used properly, uh, these technologies will help us take better, take better care of patients and reduce morbidity and mortality. Thank you. A few questions that we can start with. For Biotech M, how long do you think before this can be rolled out uh, for widespread use? Well, I think that uh, at this time, we're going to start people use the technology uh, more, at least from a controlled perspective, because I think they're going to start rolling them out uh, in the in the Department of Health hospitals. But I think it's just a very short time after that that it's available for commercial uh, use. The, the the phase three trials have been completed, and I think. Uh, from an FDA standpoint, uh, once the phase three trials are, are okay, it's just, I think, most likely next year we're going to see this widely used. Okay, another question. Do you foresee this to be available in large medical centers only, or can these tests be rolled out at the point of care, that is the clinics or even the local health centers? Well, currently, the, 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 the status is that what we're, we're looking at is um, that we can deploy these little, it's actually just like a little cup. That's what the, um, that's what the uh, heating block looks like. And so you really only need to do that um, at, uh, you could probably do that at the level where as long as you have a trained med tech and you also have somebody, uh, a power source is all you really need. So this could be deployed even at the clinic level. Um, not maybe not quite the barangay level, but you know primary care clinics can probably deploy this uh, without much. Uh, uh, what about the turnaround time? When should results? Uh, when do we expect results to be available? Well, this is actually a near point of care, so um, at most it'll take a about six hours to get the, the, the result. Uh, we're working on trying to get it earlier at two hours. There is a fluorescent reader which can detect uh, the fluorescence earlier as opposed to looking at visual color change or turbidity. But uh, this is much better than um, you know uh, doing PCR, which is really the only thing that's comparable with. Um, and uh, whereas your NS1 and your IgM, IgG, those have near point of care iteration, but the sensitivity and specificity does not uh, approach what Yeah, so Gene Expert uh, is really used to diagnose active tuberculosis uh, because there are, it has a limited detection of five um, uh, genome equivalents per ml of sample. So it will diagnose as uh, pulmonary tuberculosis where there is uh, at least five organisms per ml of sputum. It will not diagnose latent tuberculosis uh, because uh, that you, you're not going to have free organism in the sputum uh, at that time. The other um, thing is that you cannot use GeneXpert as a uh, test for cure because GeneXpert uh, detects DNA and the DNA can stay a while 
um, especially in somebody with a lot of uh, infection, a lot of disease burden. So even if you've given the treatment and all the TB is dead, um, you're not going to see uh, all that DNA come out until much later on. So it's not used as a test for cure, but it is very, very sensitive for Okay, while we're on gene experts, uh, do you have any insight on how this will impact diagnosis of TB in the local health centers? So a gene expert is being rolled out by uh, WHO as a replacement uh, test, as a matter of fact, uh, for specific uh, uh, patient types. So for instance, for patients with uh, with uh, HIV co-infection, where there is a lower rate of, um, of, of sputum smear positivity, and also for patients who are at risk for MDRTB because you get the data about rifampicin resistance much earlier. Um, now, there is also a grade one recommendation to completely use it to replace uh, sputum uh, for diagnosis. Uh, but uh, from a cost perspective, uh, at, the, at the Philippine level and resource limited settings, uh, it's not something that's being implemented yet. But for, for HIV co-infection as well as MDR suspects, uh, currently the government, the Philippine government, is actually making gene expert available for free for these uh, patients. In the private setting, um, it can be used as well for others, um, including um, a diagnosis of uh, a TB meningitis, uh, CSF, um, instead of a TB PCR. Uh, but uh, right now, the cost uh, will be borne by the, by the individual. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, again, we have one more question. What about the impact on management of cases and TB in the local health centers? Another one was a question on impact of diagnosis. Maybe this one is a question of the management of cases. Well, and what about TB? We well, might as well go to the next question also, so which is TB specific mortality. Yeah. So I think that because this uh, test is so sensitive, that we're going to be able to detect TB cases much earlier and we'll have fewer missed cases. And so that will impact on morbidity and mortality as well. Um, second is that we will detect drug resistance much earlier. And so people will be treated more appropriately early on instead of inducing even more resistance by giving inappropriate medications. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I think that with the next uh, uh, TB prevalence uh, survey, which is actually being undertaken by the by, by UP and the Foundation for the Advancement of Clinical Epidemiology, we're actually going to see most likely a spike in the number of cases because this is such a sensitive uh, test. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because those were people that we used to miss or, you know, it used to take eight weeks to get the culture back and then a lot of them will get lost to follow up. But because this test, um, works in two hours, you know, you will uh, you you will retain a lot of patients because a lot of patients, you know, they say, well, you know, we come from far away, we don't really have time to go back for this test or, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. And so I think that this has multiple impacts. First of all, um, less people lost to follow up. Second, earlier detection of disease. And third is uh, earlier detection of resistance. And so to more appropriate treatment. Okay, I have one last question on my list. What about the cost of the test? Often the problem is uh, tests are perceived to be very expensive and doctors usually rather treat empirically rather than send the patient out for tests. And we might lose patients who we send out on testing. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, especially when we're talking about uh, uh, resource-limited settings. Now, for instance, the HIV antibody tests are very, very cheap. Um, the, the actual material cost to the government is about six pesos per per um, per test. Uh, for the gene expert, there is what we call global pricing, uh, depending on whether it's a government uh, facility that's uh, or a government that's buying the test. So, for instance, for gene expert, while the commercial cost of a cartridge is about two hundred dollars, the 
cost to our national program is only about ten dollars, and uh, all of those are negotiable. And as we see more players going into the market, I think that's going to drive uh, the costs down as well. Now, um, looking at intangibles or uh, downstream, if you diagnose someone with tuberculosis earlier, then there's a lot less pain and suffering as opposed to getting disseminated tuberculosis. Or in the case of HIV, where we have problems retaining patients in care because if you do the test and you say, well, you know, come back um, the next day and if it has to be sent for a confirmatory test that can take two to four weeks, then um, you can lose your patients to the the point that only about 40% of patients come back for their tests. But if you have a point of care test that gives you an answer and you can tell the patient, well, you know, you have to do this and do that, make sure that you follow up because we actually have treatment for this and you can live a long time as opposed to being in limbo and not, not knowing. And so they, they're, not, they're not empowered by their, by their diagnosis and they're not able to, um, they're not able to act on it. Uh, in a positive way, then I think that uh, in the long run, these tests can only help us take better care of our patients. Again, let's repeat that. I forgot to turn my mic on. If the gene expert utilizes treatment to diagnose active pulmonary tuberculosis, how about the screening and management of TB among children? So for children, um, well, I'm, first of all, I'm not a pediatrician, <laughs> um, but the, for, for children who can um, produce sputum, um, you, can use, uh, you can use gene expert the same way. Um, for gastric aspirates, um, there's not a specific recommendation about that, but, but if you look at the WHO guidelines, they actually do recommend using this. For so sensitive. If you're not able to make as much sputum, it may still come back positive. It's not an ideal situation, but it's probably better than your regular sputum screening. As for gastric aspirates, uh, the jury is still out on that. They haven't made a specific recommendation. But pretty much whatever you did to diagnose TB in the past, either gastric aspirates or, or um, uh, whatever else techniques that people use to induce sputum, you can do that for gene expert and still be successful, more successful with it. Okay, and uh, another question. Where are these tests and where are the machines that are available now in the Philippines? And would you know how much they cost at the centers where they are available? Right, so for the, for the gene expert, uh, um, uh, if you have, uh, well, the, the, the PMDTs have access to them, the, um, the programmatic management of drug system tuberculosis. The uh, uh, health centers have access to them if they have suspected uh, drug resistance as well. Now, um, they are also accessible in commercial uh, establishments, but like I said, it will have to be out of pocket uh, at this time. And those costs can be significant depending on what kind of deal uh, the, the hospital makes. But again, if there are equivocal uh, findings, you have somebody who has uh, signs and symptoms of tuberculosis and the sputum is repeatedly negative, you have an equivocal x-ray, um, you know, short of doing a, a CAT scan or an invasive bronch, you can do the expert and you can save all that money. So it's really just putting it in the context of what the use is for, uh, where you can figure out if the cost-benefit ratio is advantageous to the patient. But it's nice to have options. I have another question. What about, uh, have we reached the level of maturity in dealing with uh, confidentiality of our results, especially with the results of maybe tuberculosis, especially multidrug resistance, tuberculosis, and even our HIV results for that matter? Because that's probably one of the deterrents for many of our patients not to seek uh, this. Right. So in general, uh, all of these medical information, it's not just HIV, it's not just DB, it really should be covered by confidentiality under law. But obviously, it leaves much to be desired. Perhaps it's more of a policy issue and also a, a well, not even more than a policy issue, uh, probably a, an enforcement issue. 
because uh, even if our, our laws actually protect uh, medical information, your doctor cannot be compelled to testify regarding your health in court uh, without a specific court order to do so. And that is covered by um, doctor-patient uh, uh, confidentiality. Unfortunately, I think what we really lack in is more the enforcement and the practice of, of how these things, we don't even need a specific information it is, whether it's, for instance, um, breast implants, like what happened with one of the former presidents that never should have leaked out. And so it's really an enforcement issue more than, more than a policy issue at this time. Okay, thank you for that engaging discussion. We, uh, there being no more questions, let me just reiterate the summary of Dr. Uh, Edsel Saldana. Next generation diagnostics have increased the capacity to make timely diagnosis through innovative utilization of technology. The major advantage, advantages include shorter time to result uh, to the the point of care and near point of care, the increased sensitivity and specificity, increased information from samples, uh, and automation. Disadvantages may include more complex systems, the higher initial costs, and proprietary technology. Used properly, they will help us to better take care of patients and reduce mortality and morbidity. Uh, after this session, an email containing a survey link will be sent to our attendees. Please answer the survey so we can assess our webinar and address more of your preferences and give you materials from this session. After answering the survey, your certificates will be sent to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we end, maybe we'll, we can ask Dr. Edsel if he has any final words. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I think it's important to understand, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of these new technologies because they really can only help us take better care of patients. Um, the cost is always an issue at the start, but again, we have to take a long-term look at uh, how these things will eventually save patients money and also uh, make it uh, better, you know, better manage uh, their cases. Early diagnosis always uh, Go, um, results in less morbidity, less mortality, and so in the long run, it could become a cost effective. Okay, again, thank okay, you, Dr. Yeah, Edsel. Uh, hope to see you again in our next webinar on December 2, that's Wednesday, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Manila time. Our next speakers for December 2 uh, are Dr. Ruth Tibina Grasha on management of COPD and Dr. Ivan Mina on biologics. For our January webinar coming up is Dr. Grace Tamesis. Um, please invite your colleagues to join us in this continuing monthly uh, CME webinar series. All webinar schedules and resources will be posted at www.upm.etu.ph slash upmedwebinars. Special thanks to our sponsor, uh, Omnibus. In behalf of Class 1990 and the UP Medical Alumni Society, we also thank our collaborator units, UP Manila Information Management Service, the National Telehealth Center, UP College of Medicine, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, and the Medical Informatics Unit, DOST, ASTI, and Ms. Charis Orhalo, our host. This is Dr. Santiago together with Dr. Salvana and the UP Med webinar team closing this session. We hope you learned a lot from today's webinar. Join us again next month and have a great week ahead.